Hey guys, it's Mrs. Brewer, and today I'm super excited to be coming to you from my backyard. It's beautiful outside, so if you haven't got outside today, go outside and get some time out running around. And we are going to read chapter 17 of The Lightning Thief. So, let's go ahead and let's get started. Chapter 17, we shop for waterbeds. Seems like a weird thing to do when you're on a quest, but okay. It was Annabeth's idea. She loaded us into the back of a Vegas taxi as if we actually had money and told the driver, Los Angeles, please. The cabbie chewed his cigar and sized us up. That's 300 miles. For that, you gotta pay up front. Do you accept casino debit cards? Annabeth asked. He shrugged. Some of them, same as cash or credit cards. Gotta swipe them through first. Annabeth handed him her green Lotus Cash card. He looked at it skeptically. Swipe it, Annabeth invited. He did. His meter machine started rattling. The lights flashed. Finally, an infinity symbol came up next to the dollar sign. The cigar fell out of the driver's mouth. He looked at us, eyes wide. Where to in Los Angeles, uh, your highness? The Santa Monica Pier. Annabeth sat up a little straighter. I, and I could tell that she liked the your highness part. Get it? Get us there fast and you can keep the change. Maybe she shouldn't have told him that. The cab speedometer never dipped below 95 miles an hour the whole way through the Mojave Desert. On the road, we had plenty of time to talk. I told Annabeth and Grover about my latest dream, but the details got sketchier the more I tried to remember them. The Lotus Casino seemed to have short-circuited my memory. I couldn't recall what the invisible servant's voice had sounded like, though I was sure it was somebody I knew. Uh, the servant had called the monster in the pit something other than my lord. Some special title or name... The silent one, Annabeth suggested. The rich one? Both of those are nicknames for Hades. Maybe, I said, though neither one sounded quite right. That throne room sounded just like Hades, Grover said. That's the way it's usually described. I shook my head. Something's wrong. The throne room wasn't, part, wasn't the main part of the dream. And that voice from the pit, I don't know. It just didn't feel like a god's voice. Annabeth's eyes widened. What? I asked. Oh, nothing. I was just... No, it has to be Hades. Maybe he sent this thief. It's the invisible person to get the master bolt and something went wrong. Like what? I... I don't know, but if he stole Zeus' symbol of power from Olympus and the gods were hunting him, I mean, a lot of things could go wrong. So this thief had to hide the bull or he lost it somehow. Anyway, he failed to bring it to Hades. That's what the voice said in your dream, right? The guy failed. That would explain why the Furies were searching for when they came after us on the bus. Maybe they thought we had retrieved the bolt. I wasn't sure what was wrong with her, but she looked pale. But if I already retrieved the bull, I said, why would I go to the underworld? To threaten Hades, Grover suggested. To bribe or blackmail him to get your mom back. I whistled, you have evil thoughts for a goat. Why, thank you. But the thing in the pit said it was waiting for two items. If the master bold is one, what's the other? Grover shook his head, clearly mystified. Annabeth was looking at me as if she knew my next question and she was begging me not to ask it. You have an idea what might be in that pit, don't you? I mean, if it's not Hades. Percy, let's not talk about it. Because if it isn't Hades, no, it has to be Hades. Wasteland rolled by. 
We passed the sign that said California State Line 12 miles. I got the feeling that I was missing one simple critical piece of information. It was like I, when I stared at a common word that I should know, but I couldn't make sense of it because one or two of the letters were floating around. The more I thought about the quest, the more I was sure that confronting Hades wasn't the real answer. There was something else going on, something even more dangerous. The problem was, we were hurtling towards the underworld at 95 miles an hour, betting that Hades had the Master Bolt. If we got there and found, ourselves, found out that we were wrong, we wouldn't have time to correct ourselves. The solstice deadline would pass and the war would begin. Your answer's in the underworld, Percy. You saw spirits of the dead. There's only one place that could be. We're doing the right thing. She tried to boost our morale by suggesting clever strategies for getting into the land of the dead, but my heart just wasn't in it. There were just too many unknown factors. It was like cramming for a test without knowing the subject. And believe me, I had done that more times than I wanted to. The cab sped west. Every gust of wind through Death Valley sounded like a spirit of the dead. Every time the brakes hissed on an 18-wheeler, it reminded me of Echidna's reptilian voice. At sunset, the taxi dropped us at the beach in Santa Monica. It looked exactly the way LA beaches do in the movies, only it smelled worse. There were carnival rides lining the pier, palm trees lining the sidewalks, homeless guys sleeping in the sand dunes, and surfer guys waiting for the perfect wave. Grover, Annabeth, and I walked down to the edge of the surf. Why now? Annabeth asked. The Pacific was turning gold in the setting sun. I thought about how long it had been since I stood on the beach at Montauk, on the opposite side of the, of the country, looking out at a completely different sea. How could there be a god that controlled all of this? What did my science teacher say? Two-thirds of the Earth's surface was covered in water? How could I be the son of someone that powerful? I stepped into the surf. Percy, Annabeth said, what are you doing? I kept walking up to my waist, then my chest. She called after me. You know how polluted that water is? There's all kinds of toxic. That's when my head went under. I held my breath at first. It's difficult to intentionally inhale water. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. <gasps> I gasped. Sure enough, I could breathe normal. I walked down into the shoals. I shouldn't have been able to see through the murk, but somehow I could tell where everything was. I could sense the rolling texture of the bottom. I could make out sand dollar colonies dotting the sandbars. I could even see the currents, warm and cold streams swirling together. I felt something rub against my leg. I looked down and almost shot out of the water like a ballistic missile. Sliding along beside me was a five-foot-long Mako shark. But the thing wasn't attacking. It was nuzzling me, healing like a dog. Tenet I touched its dorsal fin. It bucked a little, as if inviting me to hold tighter. I grabbed the fin with both hands. It took off, pulling me along. The shark carried me down into the darkness. It deposited me at the edge of the ocean proper, where the sandbank dropped off into a huge chasm. It was like standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon at midnight, not being able to see much, but knowing the void was right there. The surface shimmered maybe 150 feet above. I knew I should have been crushed by the pressure, but then again, I also shouldn't have been able to breathe. I wondered if there was a limit to how far I could go. Could I sink straight to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean? Then I saw something glimmering in the distance in the darkness below, growing, uh, growing bigger and brighter as it rose towards me. A woman's voice like my mother's called Percy Jackson. As she got closer, her shape became clearer. She had flowing black hair a dress made of green silk. 
light flickered around her, and her eyes were so distractingly beautiful. I hardly even noticed the stallion-sized horse, seahorse she was riding. She dismounted. The seahorse and the mako shark whisked off and started playing something that looked like tag. The underwater lady smiled at me. You've come far, Percy Jackson. Well done. I wasn't quite sure what to do, so I bowed. You're the woman who spoke to me in the Mississippi River. Yes, child. I am a Nirid, a spirit of the sea. It was not easy to appear so far upriver, but the Naiads, my freshwater cousins, help sustain my life force. They honor Poseidon, even though they do not serve in his court. And you? You serve in Poseidon's court? She nodded. It has been many years since a child of the sea god has been born. We have watched you with great interest. Suddenly, I remembered faces in the waves off Montauk Beach when I was a little boy, reflections of smiling women. Like so many of the weird things in my life, I'd never really given it much thought. If my father's so interested in me, I said, why isn't he here? Why doesn't he speak to me? A cold current rose out of the depths. Do not judge the Lord of the Sea too harshly, the Nirid told me. He stands at the brink of an unwanted war. He has much to occupy his time. Besides, he is forbidden to help you directly. The gods may not show you favoritism. Even to their own children? Especially to them. The gods can only work by indirect influence only. That is why I am here to give you a warning and a gift. She held out her hand. White pearls flashed in her palm. I know you journey to Hades realm, she said. Few mortals have ever done this and survived. Orpheus had great musical skill. Hercules had great strength. And Houdini, who could escape even the depths of Tartarus. Do you have these talents? Um, no, ma'am. Ah, uh, but you have something else, Percy. You have gifts you have only begun to know. The oracles have foretold a great and terrible future for you, should you survive to manhood. Poseidon would not have you die before your time. Therefore, take these. When you are in need, smash them at your feet. What will happen? That, she said, depends on the need. But remember, what belongs to the sea will always return to the sea. What about the warning? Her eyes flickered with green light. Go with what your heart tells you or you will lose all. Hades feeds on doubt and hopelessness. He will trick you if you can, make you mistrust even your own judgment. Once you are in his realm, he will never willingly let you leave. Keep the faith. Good luck, Percy Jackson. She summoned her seahorse and rode off into the void. Wait, I called. At the river you said don't trust the gifts. What gifts? Goodbye, young hero. She called, her voice fading. You must listen to your heart. She became a speck of glowing green, and then she was gone. I wanted to follow her down to the darkness. I wanted to see the court of Poseidon. But I looked at the sunset darkening on the surface. My friends were waiting. We had such little time. I kicked upwards to the shore. When I reached the beach, my clothes dried instantly. I told Grover and Annabeth what had happened and showed them the pearls. Annabeth grimaced. No gift comes without a price. Uh, they were free. No, she said. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That's an ancient Greek saying translated pretty well into American. There will be a price, you just wait. With that happy thought in mind, we turn our backs onto the sea. All right, so tomorrow we'll find out why they went shopping for waterbeds. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. See you guys.